Ah, hello again, YouTubers. Um, I was doing this series on Shows Your Workshop, and we've done the lathe and we've done the Miller machine quite intense. Uh, but what we haven't done uh, is any tooling. So I'll do this video about the tooling. We'll start off with the lathe. Um, I started getting it all out on the bench over here and uh, I thought there isn't much, it'll, it'll all fit on the bench but of course it won't. You just don't realise how much stuff you actually collect and uh, there's quite a lot of stuff there. So we'll go over without uh, further ado and I, I'm, I will try to work out with the best way of doing it. So I think what we'll do is we'll start at the uh, chuck end um, and we'll start with chucks and whatever else you want to put on there. In fact, I still haven't got, there's something else I need to get out of faceplate. And then probably move down to the tailstock and anything that I think would be relevant. Basically, this is not anything to do with any of you pros out there that have got all your machines set up and use them regularly. But more really for people who are thinking about buying a lathe. Uh, or indeed a miller machine and uh, I'm assuming a lathe would be first it's got to be your first port of call I suppose as a lathe and um, all the stuff that I've got for it and maybe mention what's essential and what's not because a lot of what I've got is not essential to, to start off uh, doing some turning on a lathe you don't really need that much I suppose a three jaw chuck to start you off um, something in tailstock to support and maybe a chuck for drilling for centre drilling and a couple of lathe tools or so for cutting and you wouldn't need much more to get you started in fact that's all I had really when I started apart from when I bought the lathe it came with some second hand various fixtures and things um, but all the tooling is what I've bought and mostly it's second hand um, it's, not, it's not all new uh, but we'll, we'll go through it all, so we'll go over onto the bench and we'll make a start looking at the chucks. Okay. Okay, so your basics. A three jaw chuck, obviously, is a must. Um, if you only had a four jaw, then that'd be fine. But a three jaw is what usually comes with a machine. On my particular lathe, it screws on and it indexes in here. Um, and it's just a screw on chuck so you can't you can run it in reverse but you can't actually turn metal in reverse it would the chuck would unscrew so that's the three charge up done uh, done so this is the four jaw this is a slightly bigger one i think this is five inch or four and three quarters or something is this uh, and as you can see as it says four jaws and this particular one, each jar is individually adjusted. So if you wanted to turn a piece of bar offset, then obviously simply you could adjust the jars offset. This, this particular type, these jars are, are reversible. So you can take them out, turn them around and put them back in. So you can hold on the outside of something or on the inside of something. Um, if you used this, you really would need, which is a must, you would need, where have I got it? I've put it somewhere. Right, so what you would need if you defar your chuck is some sort of a, a DTI or some sort of indicator that you could put onto your machine. Um, this is something I just cut up from some, some alloy uh, and fastened this nice DTI to it which rotates uh, and that's your, your finger. So that fits in my um, quick change tool post uh, and then you can put your pointer up against the work put some load on it and then you can adjust it till you get your uh, figures that you need as in centering the work by adjusting each of the jaws individually you would eventually get your part dead centre believe me if you've not done it before it takes a bit of doing it's, uh, it's slow and laborious but you can get there in the end if you uh, keep at it, you can do it. 
Okay, so that is a must if you're going to use a four jaw chuck. If you've got a three jaw chuck that's quite accurate, then you might get away with it. And especially if you're just starting out and you've got some bits of bar and you just want to turn some fancy bits and try things out, you probably wouldn't need one. But if you've got a four jaw chuck, it's pretty much a must. The other thing, addition that I, uh, and you'll have seen this if you've watched any of my other videos, it's uh, an ER25 which you can get ER32 which is bigger and you can even get an ER40. I got the 25 simply because I've got the collets to fit a 25 that came with the Miller machine. But again it's a great little addition and I got that running fairly accurate uh, and again it, this is specifically for my food and it screws on. Uh, but I've no doubt for whatever lathe you might buy whether it's a Chinese import one that has a a different method of fixing a chuck on you'll get an adapter there's always adapters available so that you can put an ER25 on why would you want to use an ER25 over a chuck well there are times to be honest with you where if you especially if you want to work near the chuck and your hands are going to be near it then there's not much to catch your hands on with that you know as you can see it's pretty flush and once your parts nipped in there um, you, you haven't got any much to catch and if you did catch your hand you probably wouldn't hurt yourself uh, obviously if you've got that and you've got something clamped in it and these jaws are stuck out and you start working really close up and you haven't got a lot of experience you're likely to catch your fingers on there and maybe bash your knuckle or worse so be warned again this is only information for pure amateurs like myself that just self-taught okay we'll move on a little bit so I'll stop this video and start it again with some more tackle on here so that is for the the chuck end where you're going to be holding your work uh, and, and cutting it okay so also well at the chuck end you might need at some point to buy things now that's a back plate um, it doesn't fit my lathe properly it screws on so far and then stops and it goes tight and I don't quite know why because I'm sure it's the right thread but it seems to grab so that needs some work on it but that's just a back plate if you buy yourself a, a different chuck you usually have to buy a back plate that suits your lathe and then you have to fit it, mill it, sorry, machine it and drill it to fix your chuck or whatever it is you're fixing it to. This is a back plate. Now, if, you just, if, you, if you're going to make something like a, a steam engine and you want to uh, grip something on here, let's say it's a, a cast wheel off a train or a large flywheel, say, off a little traction engine or something, uh, and you want to turn it obviously there's not much way you can grab it in a chuck not easily whereas with a fixture plate like this a back plate that simply screws on again it's filthy I haven't used it never used it but that you screw on in place of your chuck and then you can bolt things to it so you could bolt a great big disc of aluminium to it steel whatever and machine it you could pack it off behind and then fix it so you can get right to the back of the work, so you can machine, say, a flywheel right across. Very handy thing to have. You can also use this as a, a centre guide if you want to do a uh, centre mill. I'm not even going to go into that because that's a, an art of itself. I won't even go there. But yes, you can use it for various fixings. Just thought I'd add that to the chucks. That came, both of those, when I bought my uh, lathe they were with it so I didn't buy them how much something like that had cost I don't know but uh, it looks quite substantial and I'll, I'll never get rid of it even if I never use it right okay so this is the tailstock end um, that is what we'd call a dead centre and that is to support your work so if you're a long 
piece of bar in, held in your chuck, and you want to machine it, say in the middle or to the right of it, and you start pushing with your lathe tool, you're going to bend it, it's going to flex. So what you do is you put a little centre drill mark in the middle, spot of oil on it, on there, and then you'd wind that out on your tail stock into the end of the work and you've got your support. If you're going to be doing a lot, if, you, if you're not doing a great deal, a, a dead centre is fine. Uh, and there's various types of dead centre, and that's a, a, a right sh little pointy one, look. Again, these came with my lathe and did that one as well. Now, I didn't know what that was. It's called a half centre. And I didn't have a clue what it was for. And somebody on model engineering site, I think, told me a half centre. So if you put the half centre in with the flat that way, facing yourself into the work, you can then get to do some detail work on the end of your piece of work that you're working on. Let's have a look. So if we were working on this, and we wanted to machine the end of it or, or do a detail on the end of it move that away we're going out of focus so what we could do is we'd put the half center in bit of lube on it drill a detent in the end that'll accept that and put that in and you've got then a, a support but you can still get at that part of the work with your lathe tool great little addition have i used it no I haven't, never used it, but it's there, have a drink. If you're going to be running a long time with a part, I'd suggest that you'd use a live centre. Now that's a live centre, this is MT2 taper, I've put these extra bolts in the end because on the Myford when you wind the tailstock right back, it self ejects this part. So you can break it in as tight as you want, it will self-eject. So this one has got a bearing inside it, or a pair of bearings inside it, so it rotates. Just needs a little bit of oil every now and then. This is just a cheap one that I bought. Uh, made in Czechoslovakia, it says. But it wasn't expensive, and I did buy that. But that's great if you're going to be doing a lot of work, because it won't get hot. Whereas if you start using a dead centre, you're, going to be, you're just rubbing its friction onto your piece of work and eventually it probably will get warm and start wearing that you have to keep lubricating it so that's great you're going to also uh, if you've got a lathe need to drill holes in the end of pieces of work from time to time so you're going to need a chuck so this is my dedicated chuck for the, mill, uh, the lathe I keep saying milling machine and again, it's MT2 taper, and it's the Albrac uh, hand one, which is great. But if you put a tap in there and you start tapping into some work, then you get hold of the chuck and reverse it. This thing undoes itself, and the tap falls out. Just a warning. Uh, but and it's good, but they are really, really good. You can't beat the uh, keyless chuck. All operated just by hand. Um, and in the event of anything. I did pick this up at a car boat. It's a bit rough and ready, but it's it's accurate, uh, and it's a nice Jacobs chuck, uh, and I bought a, a new key to go with it. So occasionally I'd use that if I had a problem. Um, so that's basically the tailstock end that we've dealt with. So the next thing I want to talk about is tooling. We could talk about maybe something you'd put in your tail stock like these these are not what i've made but in my cupboard i have got a set that i made i made a universal one that would hold uh, from a very large die right down to a little dinky one inch die i, I, I did um i made little adapters that fit in and if you want to do like a small die in there you drop all the little adapters in so that is all different sizes and you have a piece of bar you put that into your chuck put 
would have been better over on the lathe showing you this but so you put that into your chuck and then that would go on some oil on it and you've got yourself your die holder so if you want to put a, a thread on something you've got a die holder there that's for the smaller one and it will uh, it'll just follows the, the thread as it goes along just give it a good grip for anything a bit bigger there's all in that one you can put a piece of bar in there this is a quite a much bigger one that doesn't work off this uh, and what it's got with it is a couple of handles so it, it works like a normal die stock where you put your die in that's the smallest one that's a larger one and you just use it like a die but I got that all together off somebody on, on eBay some time ago and I got a nice little set that somebody's made them themselves that's a slightly bigger one so than that I've got three different sizes so that's for doing threading and I'll show, I'll show you that now because that's all to do with tailstock okay I'll knock off, move everything around and we'll come back so next measurements what would you need as a minimum if you were to buy a lathe well if you want to do any half accurate sort of measuring on the piece of bar or something you've turned then you would need um, uh, well that's a, a more than right it's not a mutter toy or anything uh, silly expensive I think it was £36 but you can get from Aldi and little from time to time the cheap sets that I made the uh, the depth stop for the tail stock on the Myford with and they're like £8.99 but you know they're reasonably accurate are these they do need regularly cleaning so, but yeah, uh, that sort of thing, quite a handy thing to have. And you can manage with just that if you need. If you want to do something really, really accurate, you'd probably go up to something a little bit better, which is like a, a proper micrometer. Um, this is again a more and right Sheffield, very old one. It's got the ratchet on it. But, you know, the accuracy of these is much, much more, you know, much better. That's uh, old imperial, I ain't got a metric one. Um, that's not to one inch. If you want it to go up to something bigger, they do every size you can think of. The bigger they are, the cheaper they get actually second down because nobody wants them. Uh, that's a, a one to two inch one, uh, which again, it's quite a, a nice thing. Never used it, do you need it? Probably not, unless you're doing something absolutely bang on. If you were making a bush to fit into a steel housing or something, it needed to be to, you know, a quarter of a thou or half a thou. You definitely do need something like that. Um, you, you do need some marking out solution. I bought that bottle, excuse it, looking like that, but that's how it came. But they did give me half my money back, so I ended up paying about £6 for that, I think. And it's nearly full, so it's, it's great. Uh, good stuff marking out solution and then you've got various other measuring equipment that you could use along with your micrometers that's an inside measure again these are very old I've had these for years and then you've got the standard scribe fingers straight fingered ones all right if you want to scribe something out a circle or anything or indeed do some marking out we've got the wide ones there'll be a name for them but I don't know what that name is again more and right all right good makes but they're old and you pick them up for peanuts on eBay peanuts um, another thing I did buy and um, they weren't expensive is bar gauges so if you were gonna do a hole in a piece of bar and you wanted it to be accurate you've got bar gauges to use which is quite a nice thing so you slacken the back end up push that into your bar the spring loaded plungers 
and when you've got it to fit just right in your bar, nip the back screw up. I'll try again, Stevie. Nip the back screw up, take it out, get your micrometers, measure that, uh, and you've got an accurate measurement of your bar. Because you know, doing a bar measurement's not easy. But yeah, again, they weren't expensive. A nice little addition to press. I haven't used them. Do you need them? Probably not, no. Some okay. tap wrenches, various size tap wrenches, from little dinky ones, bigger ones. And you just push your centre into it and follow it in. And you can tap the hole you've drilled to whatever size you want. It's a filthy box, Mitutoyo, Mitutoyo. Um, and I picked this up for, I think I give him 12 quid for it. And there is a video of me do, doing a repair on this. And this is a depth gauge, a really nice one. Uh, and it's incremental and digital, so it, you've got both. Uh, if any of you have saw my earlier video of repairing this, the numbers that were on here didn't match the readout on the scale, on the vernier scale, uh, which they do now. Let's have a get that to zero. I don't know if you can see it actually, but that's bang on zero. And that's reading zero. So I did get it right eventually. I had to strip it all down. I was about to give up on it. I thought it would uh, peanuts. And it, 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 it would have come with about six or seven of these different depth gauges that you can screw in. So you can do deep bar. So if you emit something and you want it to be a certain depth, um, and you want it to be that accurate, you've got different needles. No doubt you could make some of those if you wanted. Another must yeah. is a set of drills that you're going to need. Something that you definitely will need. I mean, that's, that's a set of metric drills. And I did buy recently this set, which is Imperial, because any of you saw me making this device, this knurling tool, it's all in Imperial. Um, so I needed some Imperial drills, so I bought a set from Kronos, I think it was. And they're quite nice actually, HSS, and they're really, really sharp, and none of them have dulled off yet. But if you're doing metric work, that is not a must. What probably is though, is a, a nice set of metric drills, if you're doing metric work. You can't go far wrong with that. Okay. I've got a, a tap and die set as well, which I use a lot when I'm on the lathe. Basically it's M3 through to M12, uh, and there's various die holders and some of my own in here. Uh, there's all the dies, all the taps, apart from one I broke, and various other things and drill bits that I use for a specific size. That was not cheap. That was not cheap, but it's cheap and you get your buy to start as is something like that which is a uh, park side which I believe is that little or Aldi might be Aldi uh, and you get M3, M4, M5, M6, M8, M10, M12 and all the correct drills for it and a, and a, a tap wrench and that were I'm sure that were £9 or £9.99 it were under a tenner. Good set if you're going to get a lathe and you're going to be doing drilling and tapping and things. Handy little thing to have. Okay, again, I'll knock off for a minute and I'll, we'll bring back some... We'll do cutting tools, I think, next. Right, so I have a quick change tool post um, on my lathe, which I'm sure by now most of you might have that are going to buy a lathe, or you'll buy one for it because they're a handy thing to have. If not, n no matter, you, you, these, all you're going to see is that I've, all these are tool holders that uh, I've bought and some that I've made. But it, it's not that that I want to show you. It, it's the different... Um, tools, cutting tools, so that's a boring bar. 
that's a large one. Um, a a tizzit one that I've bought. Um, yeah, that's 16 mil, a 16 mil boring bar, which is quite stable and, and sharp. Uh, and the type of tow holder I've got in there, I can get even, even on the Myford Super 7, I can get to 16 mil tooling in there with the way I've done it, as you've probably seen on my previous videos. So that's a, a 16 mil one. I think this is a 12. Yeah, that's, that's a 12 millimeter one which again is not as uh, springy as the little weedy one that I originally got. This, just for boring. Uh, and that one, I think that's eight. That's an eight millimeter one is that. And it does the job, but there is quite a lot of spring in it. You only need to get the, you know, the work holding out as, 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 as shallow as you can if you're only doing it a shallow cut then on the have this sticking out the tool holder very shallow but uh, that's for boring if you want to bore holes with that I mean you can't use that unless I've already drilled a large hole so you start off with a small drill and start boring in you want it to cut all inch diameter say in the bar of a piece of bar you'd have to work your way up until you got to a size where that would go in uh, these are parting tools, so that's a, a carbide brazed carbide insert parting tool. Only a cheap thing. And this is one I made um, that works in a fashion. I'm still actually I've done some work on my uh, compound recently uh, and on my quick change tool holder and since then it seems a lot more stable so it might be better but my main aim is to do a rare a rare parting tool post which I am going to make at some point so yes yeah, there for parting so a general work um, I've got lots and lots of different tools that's uh, again a braced carbide one and that's great for doing little chamfers you can see that for chamfering, that's really handy when you've turned a piece of metal. Uh, that is meant for alloy. The shiny ones, these insert tools, the shiny ones are generally for aluminium and soft steel. I'm not sure whether to do brass as well, uh, but they're really good. They're sh really sharp and really good on normal steel as well, I've found. So I do use that a lot on most materials, that one. Uh, my goto. I don't know why, but my favourite go-to is this little fella. And uh, it's like a, a, a diamond shaped uh, insert. It's got two cutting faces and it's sort of medium to sharp, but it's really good for facing off and doing the parallel cuts. It's quite good. And then you've got your different angles. Now this is where I get very, very baffled because that, as far as I can make out, that's called a left hand turning tool. Well, that's the way you'd look at it down on the machine when it were inserted. And to me, that's a right hand cut. <laughs> but according to that, that's a left hand turning tool. Uh, and so is that. I don't, I don't get it, but uh, I've got one that would be right. That one. That is a right hand turning tool, but it cuts to the left. So I haven't got a clue. I've heard very various people doing different comments on that, uh, but yeah, it baffles me. So lots, these are all insert tools. They're all cheap ones. They're all import cheap ones, not expensive. Uh, and you can buy sets of these. These are the little thinner ones with the smaller inserts. Yeah. If, so most of what I've just shown you is insert tooling or carbide. I have got lots of HSS. If you can see these, but I'll bring them up. So that's an HSS. It looks like actually no, it isn't. That's a, 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 a braced carbide one, and it's come off as a tip. That so that's a duffer. But 
HSS is, is wonderful in a way in that insert tooling is what it is, you buy it and you use it. If you want to make something really odd to, to do a special job, you, you know, you couldn't use insert tooling for that, could you? That's been made and ground by hand or by machine. HSS, wonderful stuff. Look at that, that's been done to cut a radius by someone. And again, it's all been machined, lovely. So if you want to do a radius, there you've got it. Um, that's another, that's an HSS parting tool. And then these, again, they're all uh, HSS tooling. And that one's been put for grooving. I suppose a circlip groove or something, maybe, I don't know. one with a nice radius on there I think I've sharpened that one up myself but you know you, HSS is not expensive and all you need is the appropriate grinding wheel I can't remember whether it's white or green now what have I got on? white oh, and I've got a green on so I'm not quite sure uh, I, I also got some diamond files just to dress them up they stay sharp for quite a long time I mean, look at profile on that one that somebody's done that's been made for some specific job. How's that? Got somebody's name on it, G E C and some numbers. Been made for a specific job as that. Another one look grooving tool there. What else we got? That's a larger one. That's a, a brazed carbide tool. Quite a tough thing that actually. I milled that down so it'd fit into my tool holder. Um, a couple of things I made uh, when I was doing my rings, that, that's a, a knurl, a single push knurl, which not much good on my foot really. Uh, but that one there is, it, that pushes that way. And that is a lighter flint from a cigarette lighter. And you know, you had old half crowns, there were serrated round edge. When I make my rings, one edge then isn't serrated so I made that so I could serrate it the same so it'd look the same that's just about it you've all seen that nice knurling tool I made that's the more yucky one that I bought that in right clever that I was going to take apart and have a play with that and see if I could make something out of it it's, they're just plain bolts threaded all the way through, just pushed through and loads of slack on them. That, yeah, won't say too much about that. Altogether I have 12 tool holders. Um, four, four came with the tool post, four I bought from a, a lad on model engineering site, Ian. Um, that didn't fit too well actually, but I made them fit in a fashion. Uh, and four that I've made myself on the milling machine. They've all had a lot taken off the bottom of them so they'll go deeper so I can use larger tooling. Again, as you've seen my videos, you'll have seen that. That's probably, oh no, no, hang on, we've got this little device. That's my ball turning device that I made for making balls. That's a, just an insert. That's a, a, a pair of bearings, there's a bearing there. A, a, a piece of a bar with a relief on it here and another bearing inside and it's uh, that locks into my Myford Super 7 uh, compound slide uh, holder hole where that would go you take it out again if you've seen my videos you'll have seen me doing that um, you'd need what's handy to have is again I'd say they are essential so if you're going to be doing centers for those points what I showed you of a dead center and a live center into the end you're going to need a centering drill now these come in all different sizes of these um, that's a medium sort of sized one they've got numbers on them but that's a number what is it oh, it just says oh no USA HSS no, don't know. Don't know what size that is. And then I've got some little dinky ones. 
if you're doing something really fine very very fine uh, and in these boxes some even more finer ones that I bought of some of the so that's for doing centering for a center if you want to drill a hole a lot of people um, in fact bulk of youtubers use a center drill um, if you're gonna do a, a drill a hole the proper way is to use a spotting drill and that is a spotting drill now what is a spotting drill the difference between a normal drill and a spotting drill is that the flute is the same angle but the cut of it across the center isn't sharp so if you try to go in with that I don't know if you're gonna get this on here but if you tried to go in with that it'd wander all over the place as you pushed it in on the bar it'd start wandering this one comes to almost a point at the end does that that is a spotting drill you come into your work gently tap 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 and away you go just drill a small hole that just to start it off and then you can go in with your drill bits they're great absolutely great of them and i'm a cheat because they're not proper spotting drills if you see that flat any of you plumbers and electricians out there don't know exactly what they are they're the center drills out of static cutters hole saws the pilot drill which have that point on because that's what they do isn't you drilling sheet steel and stuff that's all they are i had a, quite a few of them from when i had my business so why buy anything if you don't need to right most of this stuff that i've shown you has been bought second hand my tool holders are new uh, and a few of these insert tools i might have bought as a set but the bulk of my tools that i have here and all this HSS stuff, all second hand. Even my drill set, second hand, my metric one. And well, I were given, I were given that by a good friend. Uh, departed now. What else would we need? These are very handy to use. If you're going to do any any um, threading, then ultimately you might need some thread gauges, and they're really handy. So you've got on this one. 55 degree Whitworth and uh, 60 degree metric there's two full sets of them here right from super fine right up to uh, 0.25 that one metric and there's another little set I picked up here metric 60 degree 0.25 to 2.5 pitch Handy to have, not expensive, really handy to have. Somebody might say, can you make one of them for me? And you'll say, what thread is it? And they'll say, I haven't got a clue. And it could be anything. It could be BSF, it could be Whitworth, old. It could be UNF, UNC. Uh, it could be pipe thread. Literally dozens of threads. And then you go into your metric with your different pitches. Thread gauges handy to have if you buy some when you go to a car boat eh, put them in your pocket and take them with you along with a six inch ruler you never know if you buy a lathe you'll see someone and think oh I'll buy that for my lathe but will it fit you whip me a little measure out I even take my uh, digital mics with me when I go um, and thread gauges and a ruler it's a must Okay guys, we've covered, I'll see how many minutes this lot's gone on for, but we've covered pretty much all of the lathe tooling needed to get you going. You'd only need a couple of these. You don't need all that lot. You just build them up and build them up as you go along. You can start off with just a basic set. Buy a lathe. I mean, cheap mini lathe from China now. Probably won't cost you a lot of money. I don't know, I can't give you figures because I don't know, but there's some nice small little lathes that are not a lot, not a lot of money that get you up and away and might last you for quite a few years. 
I know some of them, the Walker, uh, if you look on YouTube a lot, there's lots of them with Walkers. Aid's got a Walker. Uh, and I think Blondiac, uh, Queen, I, I think hers is a, a type of Walker. I think it, it's probably a Grizzly she's got, I don't know. But they've all got a similar look about them. And they all seem to do the job all right. I've got the old Myford, but it's got a bit of wear here and there on it. I love the thing, but I'm sure if I had a, a decent sized Chinese one, I'd love that too. Okay guys, I think that might be enough for this video. I wanted to start and do the Miller machine, but if you thought I had a lot of gear here, wait till you see what I've got for Miller machine. I've tons and tons of stuff. Again, all second hand, didn't cost much. So what I probably will do is, <laughs> I'll probably sign off and say, we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching. One thing I'd forgot to show you, just a little add on at the end, I'm a bit of a sod for doing this, I'd forgot a little oil pot, that's a fancy one I made but you, you know anything I'll do, an old plastic cap, an old plastic bottle and a scabby old glue brush with some cutting oil in it, that's going to be a must if you've got a lathe because there are many times you want to cut something and you need some cutting oil on it, if you've got a, one of these wonderful old lathes it'll have a coolant system on it and you build a spray coolant on uh, but it's messy stuff and it gets everywhere there's not that many people use it unless they're in industry where they're running tooling all day long so it's a must is that if you're going to cut some threads with a tap or whatever it's a must and also an oiler great little thing to have um, there's a lot of contention about what oil you should use on a lathe but this is an old Myford and of course it, it'll say probably Myford but you use an SA30 or something or there'll be some name of an oil that were invented in 1948 or something. This oil is what I have in my jag. This is beautiful synthetic engine oil and anybody knows anything about oils will know synthetic oil especially developed because it clings to metal when you turn that engine off the oil don't just all run away you always have a film of oil on all your metal parts so when you fire that thing up cold it's lubricated synthetic oil you can't beat it I use that all the time on here I'll get possibly some comments on that but I welcome them thanks for watching again um, uh, if you liked it give us a like and subscribe please if you want to see more of these videos mostly about engineering and talking rubbish and in our workshop so shows your workshop lathe tooling and the next one whenever that'll be it'll be milling machine tooling thank you for watching bye